she has a footprint across the globe and how that globe well footprint is helping microsoft to come up with a very interesting solutions and probably very critical solutions as well to uh, take care of the many critical aspects and which are really creating huge problem for the society and for the businesses as well so i think uh, uh, <clears throat> again this is a in depth uh, discussion on this particular subject so your questions and your comments are very much uh, welcomed in this session as well so your interaction and engagement is very important critical for this session to succeed as well so uh, so this two hour discussion we will be primarily focusing and uh, uh, ashish will be leading from the microsoft so please feel free to intervene and interject and uh, put your question across so that uh, we will better understand this subject and understand this nuances of the subject involved into this one so with this introduction i will hand over this one to the ashish and then he will continue this through the discussion and he would be also joined by his colleague uh, uh, yes sir. yes yes he will be also joining him so over to you ashish okay thanks so much sir so i just you have the is it on okay great so i am audible at the back okay so good afternoon everyone let me see the slide which is there okay so let's start with the blank slide first So again, good afternoon, everyone. So we have the session on uh, forensic and response. So let's start by looking at what a response means in our minds. Let's say if you get a call from your spouse and she says, "There is no water in your bathroom." What's your first reaction? Okay, it's a response. And then she says, "There is no water in any of the bathrooms." response and a third is he says there is no water for next 5 days in the entire locality which means in anybody's bathroom whether it's your neighbor or or your or your you know, other friend so that that's a kind of a response your mind gives a different response with respect to the input you get now that's the criticality that you could define and I'll relate it to now patching okay my systems are not patched today get a different response my systems are not patched last one week get a different response but my systems are not patched for few months and years and there are some systems which are not patched get a different response so the problem in these two statements is or in these two scenarios is first one it patches you it patches your family hence the response is a little faster The second one, by the way, also impacts you because it's your job. If you are in the security or in the administration field, but here what happens is, in first scenario, the responsibility of having the basic things in house working is primarily yours. In the second scenario, when things are not patched for months or for for quite some time, the responsibility of patching may or may not be yours. and also the responsibility of patching may be delegated between different teams hence the mind behavior is not equal yes but the risk in the second case to the business and the infrastructure and all the risk so how do i value a risk uh, in terms of if i don't have a water coming in my house for one day or two day or for the entire locality the risk would be measured in terms of what will happen or not happen in case there is no water will you need to buy it from outside uh, for what needs you will buy it in what quantity you will buy it and you can this is a if this is a practical scenario you know hitting you tomorrow but in the other scenario where you have lots of pcs lots of devices you have different teams working quantification of risk is very very difficult how do you quantify a scenario where you have unpatched pcs for long okay so with that i wanted to build a mindset that from a response perspective uh, the mind behavior is very different based on what scope 
and responsibility you carry and what's something which is tangible. Okay. Now today the session that we do, so we'll have next two hours, we'll try to divide uh, the first part which is one hour focusing on uh, the uh, forensic, what the forensic study is, what, what all it has, uh, what's the kind of evidence that gets invited, how it's admissible in the court. And in the, in the printouts which I have given to you, it's a scenario. Uh, it's a scenario of a bank. It's a scenario where you will have uh, to visualize what a particular you know uh, administrator goes through and what things he has to do. Now, there's also the printout which I have given is to be shared on a table. So we thought we'll do a good group exercise, and then we could discuss the answers based on the forensic process that's laid out. Okay? Now, in this scenario, you'll also uncover. Uh, as part of those uh, printouts, some command uh, and tools which we have given. So from a Microsoft standpoint, there are certain toolkits and resource kits that we have. Uh, and if you heard Sys Internal, so we acquired a company a few years back which was Sys Internals. And Sys Internals provided a lot of tools to monitor processes, files, uh, memory, take dumps of memory, which are a very critical part of the forensic process. Okay. So as a, as a benefit of on the exercise, we've also listed all these some of, or I would say some of the tools and commands which you can run. Now, in our exercise, we'll not be running them, but you'll just be going through them so that when you do fitment in the forensic process, you can probably write down what are some of those commands and tools uh, which could fit in. Now, as you do the exercise, it's not an evaluation scenario. Uh, the intent is for you to go a little deep into the process of forensic, try to map some of the commands and look at what tools and commands would fit it in that process. Okay. Now, uh, before we start, anyone who has a experience in forensic here, who's done, okay, uh, is as part of your own interest. That's part of my experience. Okay. So you have a role which is forensic. Okay. So good, so you're old because three years in this field is still up, it is with the, the dollars. Because with the kinds of tools and capabilities which are there, it's pretty much from the physical world it's a whole forensic, but the digital forensic is, is quite different with it, all of the same process, but the amount of depth and tool and data you have to deal with it is enormous. Okay. So with that we we'll start into the slides and I'll try to finish these slides faster so that we can have more discussion and do the discussion on this scenario and give you the time to focus on the process. So, if you look at forensic, it means you have to present it before a forum. You have to present something before a forum. Now, the forum in mostly, in case of forensic, uh, is either a court, or it may not be a court, it may be an internal hearing. And here the hearing wouldn't imply that you have a team of legal experts. It could be a scenario where, let's say, if your company policy had uh, that an uh, employee would not be surfing certain websites, whether pornography or, or video sites or download something from the internet, and if he does that, and if he's caught, or if he does, does that and you suspect he's done it, uh, then what would be the steps that you take to prove that evidence? Okay. That's a simple scenario. Other could be the scenario which we have put in the, in the case study, where it's very typical of some people in an organization either bragging or rumorizing that they know salaries of XYZ people. A very common uh, you know, pattern where they would, uh, if, if it's a kind of a disgruntled employee, he might go and put things on the Facebook or Twitter and it's a social word. He might say XYZ guy is not competent but he gets salary of this much or he may just reveal the salary details. Now there are many cases which have already happened in which it's not about the salary details but the credit card details were leaked on the web. Now if credit card details are leaked on the web, it's equivalent to a sheet of data which was confidential, whether it's a list of uh, you know, people and the salaries or it's a, a credit card details. Or in Indian IT Act, if you study, it could be the names, email address uh, and other details which are considered under PII and they get leaked from an organization and that organization could be a dot com, that organization could be a manufacturing company, could be a, uh, could be a retail company. If these details get leaked, what are the steps you take internally 
to do forensic activities, what tools would you use? If you suspect your employees, how would you communicate with them? Uh, would you ask them to surrender their laptops or desktops? Would you make a copy? If the leak happened to a server, what would you do? Would you stop the application? So these are some of the things that get answered as part of the forensics. And then the evidence that you create, it's based on something. So if you look at forensic, it's a little bit like journalism. You'll have some kind of an understanding of hypothesis, and then you'll do a research for that. At the end, if you truly have to be a good forensic expert, you would either say whatever I have collected as an evidence proves my hypothesis. Or you would say, look, it doesn't, and hence we don't have sufficient evidence. Now, in most of the forensic uh, production cases that we have worked, what we figured out, the single biggest, uh, I would say, uh, factor is that most people have not enabled forensics or logs. So, incident happens, <coughs> the forensic team is called for, the team starts collecting data, and then in majority of cases, they realize that the actual data collection uh, switches or logs or events were not even turned off from it. Hence, not adequate collection will happen. And what they have to deal with is vast amount of files and data which is not related to that incident. So they have to take a long time to fish the actual data and then build a timeline. So we'll go through the process and then do that in the exercise. Forensic readiness is the ability of the organization to maximize the potential to use digital evidence while minimizing cost of investigation. Now, if you had unlimited time and tools which are costly, uh, then absolutely, you know, you could keep on doing the evidence collection. But what practical limitations happen is <coughs> you would have a limited time, let's say a 10 day, 15 day period in which you have to collect the evidence and either prove or let uh, the act of that uh, you know, incident uh, go as a closure because you have to close it. And then you have to also look at the cost of investigation because believe me, if the folks in security do something and it's, 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 it's transparent, you know, nobody sees what you guys do. And then, in addition to an incident happening, the forensic teams has a lot of tools and they spend a lot of time. So it has to be come out with a very tangible report and activity that is also seen by the stakeholders as to what you're doing. So these are some of the uh, cases where breach and the cost of the breaches are mentioned. And just a quick poll. If a particular attacker comes onto your network and he's compromised a host, let's say, what's a rough average in number of days it takes for him to move from a normal user credential that he's already compromised to a, a domain credential? Any guesses? Two days, ten days, hundred days, fifty days, may take longer. Is it a day? So at least you are on the other side, so roughly the industry average is two days. So of the cases that we handle in our premium support, we roughly see in two days, once somebody is in, he is able to do a privilege access. Now whether that is through stealing the uh, ticket, and I have a colleague of mine who is an expert at that, but we do that for prevention by the way. Okay. Uh, or it is reusing it and then you know doing a privilege uh, job which you're not supposed to. Okay. Now, if you're on the network, again, a second question, why you guess? Before you detect that somebody is there, so he's there, he's accessed your host, the host is compromised. He's uh, in, in a span of two days, three days, whatever is the average closer, has uh, made himself an administrator. That's fine. For you to detect that somebody is doing something or he's present, what's the average number of days? 2, 4, 15, 50, 100, 2 years. 270. Detection. How much, sir? 270. 270. Well, you shouldn't have said. You're part of mine, so. <laughs> okay. So, while he, while he said that, so it is the last three years, the independent study which has been done, our average comes out to be 200 plus. So, 
So one uh, gentleman would do a study with 230, other would do 70. So it's in that range, but the common denominator on the lowest side is 200 plus. Which means for 200 plus days, you don't know that somebody is there. So imagine if you have to do forensic after he's been tracked and trapped, the amount of data that you have, <coughs> because he was there for at least in any incident, He's a professional at least for 50 to 100 days. I haven't seen any case where you have less than 100 days where an attacker has some strings. So if you have a time when you have to collect data for last 100 days, then you have so many servers, some got formatted, collect all the log, build the toolkit, then run some kind of a magic. Because people then expect you to do some magic, which you can't. Because you have collected data, and believe me, it's pain to go through each and every file checking attributes, regardless of tools, and at least what I see, I haven't seen any forensic expert who's gone 100%. They go by the top. Top means they look at top 20 trends of access and, and files and other stuff. If they ever have to go through everything and that's what brings, it becomes so expensive and lengthy, it's, it's, it's quite futile doing that exercise. Unless it's an exercise which is from a national security interest, then you have to go through it. Okay. <clears throat> so, as you see this slide, the incident happens, but before that there are a host of things which have to be done. And if there is any single thing which is a key takeaway or from the session, other than forensic is, that for any forensic activity to succeed, there has to be a lot of things done pre that. Otherwise, when you do it, you will discover there is no enough data, and then you will give the recommendation, please enable this, 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 this. And if you enable so many things, and yet then you do the forensic later, you have the data, but then the question would be, what tools do you have to derive the intelligent uh, pattern from that? Now, this is the process. This also is part of your scenario, given. So if you look, the, look at this process, it says, assess, acquire, analyze, report. So this is, a process that you follow as part of forensic team. Now, when you assess, what you have to do is you will have to notify and acquire the authorization. What is, and we will get to case study. So let's say, <coughs> as a case of your, your case study, uh, there is uh, a bank, and I've deliberately named the bank as Lalu Bank because it's a bank which has a lot of money. And uh, the bank, uh, uh, there's an administrator in the bank, and then you have a suspect who's done the activity. So if in this case you have to generate an evidence and you have to prove that the suspect did a particular activity, then what is important is you have to notify and authorize. Now, before you do that, you have to first check are you legally competent to do this activity. What I mean by that is, and I'll relate this to a physical world. If in a physical world a crime happens, whether it's a murder or robbery, you are not supposed to do forensic there. There is there is law enforcement divisions doing it. But in your electronic world, which is owned by you, if there is some activity, then for majority of cases, you can do your own forensic. Unless some of those cases are related to where, let's say, uh, national security is at stake, where, let's say, uh, somebody posted something which has resulted into a problem for the company, so in those cases, you may not want to do forensic as an internal team. You may want to get hold of the legal entities also, whether it's Search India, whether it's some other uh, you know, government bodies, so that they do forensic with you. But if it's a case where a data has leaked, it's a confidential data belonging to your organization, in those cases, you don't have to get the, the, the law enforcement involved. So for majority of cases of these types, you'll have to first look at where are you from a legal perspective and ownership perspective to do a forensic activity. Now once you are, you'll have to notify and acquire the authorization. So what this means is, if I have to do forensic, I have to tell my management that I am collecting evidence, again a hypothesis, and in this, A, B, C, D employees are involved. So that's like taking a concurrence from your management, which is again part of the process. So that your management, whether it's your CEO, CFO, and the board members are aware of that. And if you're doing forensic where one of your senior members are involved, then you will also have to 
take contracts from the board during that duration, depending on the laws, the, the responsibility of, of that treatment will hand it to somebody else. Okay. So, you do that notification. Notification also goes to the suspect. So, he is aware of it. Correct? So, in some cases, he may not. But when this activity happens and it's internal, in majority of the cases, you would tell him that this is getting collected. Okay? And second is again review policies and laws. Third is identify our team members. Now, I would rather say uh, in your company, the forensic team and a toolkit should already be pre made. You can't identify a team member when an incident happens. That's too late in the game. Right? So, from a forensic readiness perspective, every organization should have a dedicated identified team. It doesn't mean that they are doing the job as a permanent on a regular basis. That could be you know, done by a consulting company who does forensic for others. But if you are in, if you if you if you want to look at forensic in your organization, then what you need to be sure is you at least have those people identified who would become part of your team in an event an incident occurs and you are asked to do forensic. Okay. Then you'll have to do an assessment. And this is a little tough part. So this is you'll have to scope it out. What is your hypothesis? What are you assessing? What will you prove? And what all things will you collect? From what all sources will you collect? Now some of this may change as you start collecting. But to start with, and why this is important, tomorrow if you prove that this was done, this statement is actually admissible in court. That you followed this process. So this process is so important that you have to document it because this becomes part of your uh, you know, submission if as a consequence of forensic, it has to go to the second stage which is the court or any law. Okay. So there you would be asked all these things, did you notify it? Did you have a team which was identified? What was the scope of the assessment? Because you can't have a scope where you will say, okay, I'll assess what he's done as a suspect on PC, and you also go and check his own PCs. But so then you're violating his privacy. But if you in your scope right, we suspect the data was leaked from his home, and he has a PC in the home, why that's not my asset, then you'll at least have to look at what legal laws permit you from an employment standpoint. But then only come into play is, as an employee-employer relationship, when you signed a contract, was it clearly stated that the employer would have rights in these cases to go and collect evidence from the assets which are belonging to the uh, employee. Okay, may not be company's own assets. Okay. So that's a circle that you'll have to complete. That's why this conduct assessment becomes very important and then prepare for evidence acquisition in which you will look at where all do I go and what all things will I collect from. Okay. And then comes the next, next day we'll, which will be acquired where we'll build the investigation toolkit and we'll go into each one of them in detail. Okay. And then you'll do analysis part. Now today most of the analysis uh, I would say is aided by machine learning. But still in the exercise we have given you the commands and sample tools which are still human uh, operated. But today the forensic are also advanced where when you collect so much of data you will be applying machine learning. And even within forensic, if you are looking at the analysis uh, part, the analysis also can happen on an offline data. But the analysis today is also happening on an online basis on a regular basis. And you go back in time to check when the incident happened what kind of data was collected uh, by, by that automated machine learning uh, software. And then you make a report at the last. Any questions? Sir? So, so these are the four building blocks which you will have. Again, we have given you a format of a report. The report will vary depending on what uh, assessment conduct that you make. Uh, but the report will completely based on that. But, but overall it will have those five, six section which talks about your hassle will be followed the process, the evidence collection, and then what uh, you know analysis you apply to conclude whether that act was done or not done in so short. Okay. And you have to preserve that entire trail of evidence. 
and train were removed from uh, assessing the situation uh, to the last uh, part which is creating the report. <coughs> so as I said, my, so this I've also given you, uh, we'll, be, we'll be sharing a document to the DCR team where we'll also uh, give you some links of these articles and PDF files which can be downloaded from a standard perspective and you follow. So as I suggested earlier, you have to quickly check before you start the forensic activity if legally you are allowed to or you have to get another legal entity to partner. So stages in access, you will have to get a written consent. Uh, so sometimes the written consent is more like an FYI to a suspect. And then you will share the scope actions you plan to take. Uh, as I said later, these actions which you plan to take are part of your court admission. So like in case it could be that the employee did not allow you uh, to access the PC because the PC also had content of the house and you are not allowed to see that. Fair, fair, you know, a presentation of, of uh, privacy. Okay? So in that case, you will have to write at the scope that the event couldn't get the access, so that's not in the evidence collection. And then team members, whether it's small or large team, has to be competent enough, who is aware of the process that you follow, who is also aware of the tools which have to be used. And then as I said, assessment scope would also include the uh, impact, uh, the sensitivity around it, if you do it. Uh, the effort which will get involved, whether it will be a week or 10 days, a longer period. Uh, technical things, would you be accessing network, would you be putting sniffers, uh, would you be as part of for instance going on to the storage, would you be retrieving the hard disk and then uh, doing a bitwise copy and then do offline or online, you know, check on that. Uh, what operating system would you touch it? So all of that you have already set in before you even started collection of the evidence. So for people who from the consulting background, in a way, it's, it's a kind of a SOW. But you're clearly putting it, but this could later be used uh, from your defense perspective as to what activities you carry out. Uh, just a quick. Yeah. So the very first step would be to contact the director. So if I know that something is made from Congress, yeah, so the first step would be contact the director. If I know that a server okay. is from Congress. So, well, so what you, so forensic is part of post response, so I'll, I'll place all these questions. So you spoke about damage, you spoke about containment of damage, and then you said the first is should be, so you're right in that way. So what happens is, if a security incident is discovered, and there is a term called cyber, cyber resilience. So are you cyber, is your organization cyber resilient? What that means is, if an attack happens, First, are you able to defend it? Okay, you're not able to defend it, but the attack is currently going on. Okay, and the nomenclature generally now we're moving from saying attack to a security incident because attack actually means a lot of things in, in brainwave. So you will basically stick to a neutral word, which is security incident. So if that security incident has happened and which you have to respond to, then as part of the response, there are two elements of response. One is. Uh, how do you handle it? And handle in terms of uh, media, uh, handle in terms of who do you call. So let's say, uh, which organization do you work in? Sir? Okay, part of yes. Why not say that one? Because you may even in, in a large company if, an, if a particular attack happens, uh, who do you go to? Let's take a quick poll. So let's say a bank, they had an attack. They get an email that you've been attacked and they've been asked ransom. What's their first reaction? Uh, and this, and if you are a part of a bank in the capacity of, let's say, a, a bank manager, and you, and you get to hear this or see this, who would you call? Okay, top management. CISO. CISO. Security team. Legal. Legal. Okay, who else? Third. Anybody from the back? Who do you call if you're a bank manager and you hear that it's been <coughs> so called attacked and uh, data owners as well? Data owners, okay. 
law enforcement agency. So imagine guys, we are all from security background. We have carriers on this. Right from somebody said legal, somebody said talk management. Assuming it's talk management and if it's a bank and I call Mr. XYZ and Mr. CEO of the bank has been attacked. What would be his reaction? Should he call CIO? Should he call CISO? If he call CISO, let's say bank has, what would the CISO do? Should he should he immediately issue a statement? Should he shut down the website? So that's answering to your question. Response, while it's while it's a very very small word, has two parts. One is what's the response management in case you are under attack. And the first thing in that is you will have to call it a security incident and verify what's happening. The verification responsibility has to be an MDD, which includes network, storage, server, and so on the other team members, and has to be as part of a virtual team that sees so. You would not go to your legal, you will not go to your media, you will not go to your law and the first guy to be called has to be CISO, who should have this team pre-designated, who then has to first verify what it is. It might happen that somebody just made a wild, you know, imaginative attempt and communicated. It may not be that, it may be something else. You might see it's a DOS attack, but it was not a DOS attack, it was some internal input, it might be some other software vulnerability, you don't know. So first thing is that. Second would be your containment where you say, okay, for me to be cyber resilient, if I am under attack, then can I respond in a way that my infrastructure continues either through my DR setup or do I have a, a cloud-based burst mechanism where my services will continue but I now may have to end up paying more for my web servers because they'll have to scale out because the attack is also growing and I'm also throwing physical infrastructure at it. And in meantime, I will restore by blocking the IP addresses on the firewall. So that's, so then as I said, the two parts. So one is verification and how would you address it? And the second is the technical tools, processes, implementation, which you will do during that period so that you either minimize it or stop it. Okay? Forensic will start after that. Forensic would be when you want to know based on the scope that we create, whether is it to find out who did it or is it to collect the evidence as to uh, what are the learning so that it doesn't occur again. So that's where you get into forensic. Okay, so it will be different and it will come post your response strategies. Yeah. Now today if you look at uh, the forensic is mostly like a where to the other area. Yeah. And your question is having some validity because the SM tools are coupled with incident response and forensics. Like once the attack happens, they're able to snap take the snapshot where I'm and they're able to do it. So that's why what he's speaking about is the reactive forensics to be fair. Because I'm in this industry for more than 23 years, right? Uh, proactive forensics and today it has reached up to level of contradictive. So forensics is not reactive. Forensics is from more from proactive, sorry, reactive to proactive to predictiveness. Right? So as you said, absolutely the SM tools couples with incident response and forensics simultaneously. That is what morning I mentioned something called super stock. The security operation centers having all these capabilities together. The real-time monitoring of the traffic and real-time doing the forensic analysis, the tools have already existed in the market. But for in-depth analysis, as you said rightly, you have to go for this at the end of the day. There is no option at all. And I'll link to what he's saying, because this will be covered in the slides ahead. So what he's saying is, while you build your understanding on forensic, he's taking it to next level, where he's saying, why can't I do this collection on a regular basis. Essentially what he's saying is, if an incident happens, you do a respond and then you do forensic and if you look back to slides, I also said that you will have to enable certain things, otherwise when you sit doing forensic, you would not, not have any data. So what he's saying is, why not make forensic in such a way that 24 hours, for everything that you're doing, a suspicious behavior, all of this is getting collected. So that when the incident happens, you can go back. And that's what I refer to as a machine learning. So a machine, a software, 
is learning your behavior, is learning what's happening around, is collecting what's happening around. If it sees a suspicious behavior, okay, it's collecting the logs, it's collecting the dumps, it's collecting the copies of memory. Now, the question you would ask is, do I need it today? And this is a fair question because these are some newer technologies. And which sectors need it first and which sectors need it later? If I am into, let's say, uh, a call center which, which does financial processing, I may need it today because one of my call center agents may do something which could be undo. But if I am in a different sector where my requirements are different, I may not need it today. Okay. So coming to the collection part, uh, so you will have to make an investigation kit, which would be hardware, software, apps, uh, toolkits, source kits, cable, media, whatever you collect which goes on that. And all of this toolkit would, would include uh, the likes of uh, manual executed tools, automated tools, and machine learning tools. Then you have to look at some of the root kits because what happens is when you when you're going and collecting some data, regardless of the methodology, online, offline, there could be somebody who's already having a software, like a root kit, which hides everything beneath and you what you see is just a zero byte. Okay? So how do you look at those those things? Like there is a from a system terminal's perspective, there is a root kit revealer, it's a command line tool which you can run. It has potential to reveal if there is any root kit installed based on the pattern the file size and the directory where it takes. So that's there. And then there's the documentation which you have to build on to focus uh, or to be used in code evidence to be the next. Which will also be who performs what, what they're attempting to do, what is the timeline of these acts. So all of that would have to be built. And there are a couple of graphical tools also which come today, some free, some commercial, which, which build that timeline. The offline investigation. So what? What are the two parts here? One is a bitwise copy, and the other is volatile data. Now there is a rule in forensic: if something is on, you let it be on, and then take a snapshot. Because what activity has been done? There could be certain strains which are left in memory. There could be certain programs which steal some data, but they have not been terminated because they came or they came into the memory as part of a buffer overflow. They were illegitimate software which came into the memory as part of buffer overflow. But if you shut the PC down, then they would also be automatically flushed out of the PC or so. So if you're collecting the evidence, so there are certain evidence which might go automatically out of the memory if you shut it down. So hence you, you would have tools which will help you to collect the memory dumps, which is the volatile data. So that you, if you suspect a particular server from where the information was leaked, and if that's the case, then you know that the memory mm -hmm. is having that program which would have copied the data. Then it's better to have a copy of that memory also. Right? So there are tools to do that. And then you will also have, uh, you have many tools to do, to make a copy of the storage, which is the hard disks and other attached storage media so that you can then copy it onto your uh, toolkit, uh, your storage, or whatever drive you have to collect the evidence. Now, the benefit of this is when you do a bitwise copy, it also copies the free space, it also copies, which does not just copy only the filled space, it does the exact mirror copy, including the root files and the root spe spec sector and all other details, so that you can then do a later offline investigation. And then you have logs, which will be your prime assets. You'll also have to tag what are your prime assets and secondary assets. So let's say if this server was compromised, but the source of that compromise or the access to that server was from a desktop or from another application, then you'll also have to look at the primary and the secondary assets from where you're collecting the evidence, followed by the environment in which you operate it. And then what you collect, again, okay, what you collect for example, uh, a simple example could be when you copy some files and the files are precious, they're important. Let's take you copying some 10 photographs from a PC to your phone. What do you see? 
a simple check would be you will see whether the number 10 and 10 is matching, right? Other check you will see whether the size of the file is 10 MB here and if it's 10 MB here as well for all the 5, 6 files. So it's a basic checksum. Similarly, when you're doing a copy of large amount of data, you just want to be sure you're not missing something. Some attribute should not be set on a file which avoids it as part of your copy process. So there are some tools again available like FCI. So all these tools do an integrity check of whatever you copy so that what you have is a true copy because you have to leave that system running in some cases. In some cases you may take it uh, and, and then if you, if you leave it there and you make a copy of that then you could do an integrity check and then do an offline session. And then storing of data, how you are storing data, where it is getting stored again should be from a process standpoint clearly documented. And some of the tools we already listed in that uh, use case that we provide. <coughs> Excuse me, could you just go back to the earlier? Yep. Huh? Okay. The next stage is so you reach the point, you build a case, you have a team, you have your toolkit. <coughs> You went, you collected the data, you use various tools for offline, online, and you already have a hypothesis in your mind what you're trying to collect. And your hypothesis for different cases could be related to proving something or disproving something. Most of the cases would be in that manner. Next is you're analyzing the data. And this becomes the the the, the stage where a maximum amount of effort goes. So you would have same tools, ARTA, packet inspection. So when you're analyzing data, so you could either have existing tools which are installed on your setup, for example, existing SIM tools, which already are collecting a month or more of data, and you can go back in time in that and do some kind of an analysis based on that. There's also tools like ARTA, which is called as advanced threat analytics. Uh, so both SIM tools and advanced threat analytics tools are available from Microsoft as well from other vendors. So in case of advanced threat analytics, what's happening is, what this gentleman also spoke about is a predictive way. Okay? So what advanced analytics does, it uses a machine learning language. So for example, if you carry a phone, your phone knows more about you. What you read, uh, what you see, what pictures you click, where you go, uh, what you type, how fast you type, whether you're running, jogging, what time you sleep. Dominantly, if, if you have access to anybody's phone and the metadata, you can predict the behavior of the person. I can tell you if I know this data for the last two years, next Sunday what you would be doing if it's a month of January or if it's a month. If I have that data longer, I can predict that information. Okay? So what advanced rate analytics does in a way is, it is learning behavior of all the devices, PCs, servers, Communication that server to server is happening, application to application is happening. So it's learning all of this in log and it requires massive storage in that depending on how you configure it. And then based on that, the idea is to not predict here in, in forensic perspective. The idea is to go back in time because the incident has happened and you have to go back in time and see and relate. Okay. And then it also comes with deep packet inspection or technology so that it can store that data for you to retrieve it later. Now, analysis of host data like caches, log, prefetch folder, by the way, Windows prefetch folder reveals way more than any other folder. So it exactly tells you what you do. And there are some forensic capabilities that we already built in uh, Office, we built in browser. So there are tools which if you use, for example, if you're employing the organization, used a browser and did something, including and accessing a site which he was not supposed to, which could have a confidential HR data. If you have to prove that he actually went and did it, what would he do? He would do any private browsing so that nobody is able to see it from the cache, right? But there are tools which are available from Microsoft so that you can go and check the browsing status, which means a normal user may not be able to go and check those logs, but you would have those forensic tools where you would go and check those logs and see at what time he did what and went on sites, but 
whether internal or external, and did he actually download it some of the confidential HR data? Okay. So, so those would be the tools which will be part of your analysis process. And uh, then you will examine, uh, you can also look at some of the tools like Process, Explorer, Logon Session, ES file. Uh, if it's a server which you believe is compromised, then most of these servers uh, automatically attach themselves or the malware attaches to some of the auto run processes. So there are also tools so that you can check uh, what processes are automatically getting run on a particular machine. And if, if in a case where encrypted file system is there, so that's a major hurdle for forensic experts because sometimes they have the data, they have taken a bitwise copy, but that folder or that particular data is encrypted. Now what do you do with the encrypted drives? You'll have to again check what tools and processes you can follow. So we are not giving you guidance that any encryption can be broken, so it's a lengthy process. Even if you have to break it to an encrypted file system, it requires understanding, plus it requires a lot of compute power, even if you have to do some kind of compute force. And if it's implemented with different kinds of algorithms, let's say AES 1024, in some cases you can't. So just check as to what encryption uh, if is there and if is there what's what's followed. In some cases the encryption is from an enterprise and if the encryption is from the enterprise like EFS, you do have formal ways of getting a recovery key. So in that case, if you get a recovery key, you can decrypt that data from a forensic perspective, but you will have to check that. Um, the online forensic, there are some tools which Microsoft also has from an online forensic, which will be able to uh, pick up things in registry, peripheral memory, caches, main memory, network state. So all this from a running perspective also gets captured uh, so that you can do a later analysis. And, and uh, all the tools which I am showing you are free. So Microsoft doesn't charge us other than the advanced threat analytics, which is more from a predictive perspective. So the idea was to tell you about the tools not to sell you because we don't sell them. They're all complementary. Now the memory analysis also, the, from a tools perspective is there, uh, which can even uh, pick up things from raw dump or crash dump or a virtual machine state. So again, there are certain tools which have been listed out that can be used. So this is the kind of structure which you get. This is a commercial tool by the Now, once you're doing forensic, you'll also get this new creator, which is malware. Because when you're doing forensic uh, post an incident, uh, it could be that the incident did occur, but the agent to carry that incident or the agent that enabled that incident was some kind of a malware that was just sitting in your in your PC or in your server. So it's a malicious software. Uh, it could be a Trojan horse. It's basically designed uh, to let some unfederated access to do an activity which otherwise deemed as illegal from you working. <coughs> so this is what you'll be doing, practically checking the pieces there and the servers if they're in a good state or not. Okay. And if you look from a malware perspective, uh, today we are somewhere on the top end where earlier people used to have uh, scripts and tools, they used to do it for fun. Uh, today the cyber crime, to the group who's there, you're well aware it's fairly organized and just to give you a typical hacker in Russia probably makes more than 150,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, so that's a good amount of money. Until too many of them get created to lower the price, but the current state is that they make too much of money. And there's a good amount of money involved, serious money, uh, in, in, in hacking and spinning activities. So today you see more of uh, organized hacker groups. So the solo guys will put a script and run. So they're still there, but the number is, 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 is very low. So currently the trends that you see are more related to you know, operations which are done together by organized folks. And then the more states concert the you know, things that are happening. Now, this is a glimpse of 2014, uh, but I'm also pleased to share with you within Delhi, uh, Microsoft has opened Cyber Security Engagement Center. Now that's an engagement center where we call all the customers of Microsoft uh, and show them 
a live feed of malware which is coming out of India. Now it's a secure facility. It's a service that Microsoft delivers to the customers at no cost. It's also a service where um, we had yes from the LCAT. So it's a service which is run by our, uh, our legal team. So it's a service where our legal team uh, does certain operations uh, on botnet. So they go and actually track down malware and they do a, a botnet operation. So in India, they work closely with Cert uh, India. They also work closely with the law enforcement agencies in India. Uh, for example, Ramnet, which was a botnet, was taken down a few months back, uh, working very closely with the Indian law enforcement agencies. So Ramnet was a botnet, a malware, which was stealing information uh, from mines. It's a financial category botnet. And if you search for it, so the amount of money which has got measured into uh, Ramnet is close to half a million dollars in different bank accounts. So today in India, uh, we stand number one when it comes to malware footprint. Now there could be various reasons. So we are far ahead, the US is number four. So we show this trending data and we also show a live feed. So the feed that we show to the customers when they visit our cyber security engagement center in Delhi is we show them across different gateways, whether it would be Telco 1 gateway or Telco 2 gateway. We show them in live the amount of threats which are coming. And those threats which are viewed, so I'll give you an average. So of, of the recent uh, visits that we have done, so roughly in a day around 12 million malware threats are eliminated from India on a day. So this is a little outdated slide. Uh, but just to say with you, so if any of you or, or your organization would be interested, so as again said, it's a, it's a complimentary offering, no cost, no commitment offering, where the intent is uh, for Microsoft to educate and make aware the customers on these threats and also then share some of the tools uh, through which a remediation process can happen. So that's a, a one time complimentary anti-manager assessment. So this is also what we do for customers, wherein if they give us their public IP addresses, then we can uh, use some of the big data uh, platforms that we have uh, to map on some of these threats which they're coming from and share with them a report which tells them if their uh, infrastructure, servers and PCs potentially could be infected with malware. Some of the client forensic tools that we have, so this again is a list which is uh, available in the sheet. So this quickly tells uh, if you have to do a disk copy, what are the tools which would be available. And by the way, if you do a disk copy and it had a malware, that would come in the disk copy as well. So that's why it's also important to look at uh, an anti malware or also keep that in mind when you're doing forensic activities. There are other utilities as well which are listed out on the site if you have to make a this copy. Now, there are some of the locations where some of the client forensic tools entries would be made. So again, this is for more of a detailed uh, discussion where you could have these slides. And as I said, there is there are tools available for IE and there are tools available for Office other than Windows and the tools which are shown, which can generate a lot of data which could be of interest to a forensic investigator. Now as you analyze the data, uh, you would have to look at the network, the, the disk copy data that you have, uh, you will have to study the metadata of the files. There are some commercially available tools like NKs and TK uh, Pro Discovery. So these are commercially available tools, fairly priced, but they are value for the money because the amount of Graphical intelligence and intuitiveness it brings into the forensic is, is very, very high and amazing. So these are some of the tools as well, which are non microsoft but commercially available. Some versions, I guess, are some freely available versions would also be there, which could be used for analyzing the data. And then you also have another very handy utility file viewer, which gives you a quick view on the uses of files, peaks and patterns, so that you can put a timeline and it can match with respect to if the incident happened during a Friday night and a Saturday morning, then what are the files which are maximum getting access to in that time? And then comes the final stage where you're building a report. So you've gone through the earlier stage from assessing the situation to acquiring the data, 
which has gone through myriad of tools and that it's scoped it well. Uh, you have put the data analysis and analysis while it was a longer part. Uh, today it's, it's aided with some of the advanced threat analytics and some of the uh, same based tools which can even do a uh, you know, back end calendar time and then relaying the data. Uh, next comes is report generation. So now, now is the time when you when you'll have to see whether the data is supporting the hypothesis that you made. If data supports the hypothesis, then you have the evidence and then you can either produce for the next step, which could be an internal termination or uh, uh, kind of a, a reminder to an employee, or if it's to be produced in the code of law, then it would be depending on the, the legal next step that you take. So in which you will clearly a purpose of report authors, the incident summary timeline. So most of these forensic reports come at time when I shared with you there's some graphical tools available for that as well. And your hypothesis, which you will clearly chart it out, this is what you were looking at when you collected or started collecting the, the evidence. The evidence details and all those things that you had and assessed the situations are there mentioned, which includes the detail scope, uh, the collection process, and the conclusion, which generally becomes hard because then what we have seen during forensic evidence is there is there is still a good amount of time where you neither can prove something or disprove something because you don't have sufficient data. So what do you do? So as a forensic person, you had a hypothesis. Should you say, while I have insufficient data, I believe based on my gut or judgment, this was committed. Uh, while if it's committed, how do you prove it's committed by this individual? So there would be times when there would be gray areas. So I don't have any answer to that. And should you go in a very pro or in a you know, different fashion, but that will that will depend. You know, if it's a what what we have seen is when it's more about national security or certain incident where the government is involved, then they take they tend to take a hard stand. Okay, and a conclusion supporting document. So so with this, what will happen is your your process of forensic will finish, and you will at least be able to uh, submit a report, whether to the internal stakeholders or to the law enforcement agency or uh, to the issuing, you know, order issuing body. Now next is, it will be incomplete if you don't talk about anti-forensic. Okay, so there are tools available in the market, I would say a lot of them really available, bulk of them, uh, which if ran, because as forensic what you're doing is you're collecting evidence, but what if somebody is smart enough to run an anti-forensic tool? And he's either fractured that evidence so that whatever interpretation you will do is wrong. And that's been done deliberately. For example, you are looking at catching this employee, which you suspect has uh, copied the confidential HR data and revealed on the internet. But what if this employee was smart cookie where he already ran anti-forensic tool, where half of the data has been deleted and some junk data has been keyed in so that when you start collecting evidence, with this hypothesis, he suddenly pointed that this was not done. Or the data would say this is done by CEO. So imagine if you start collecting and it points to it's been done by CEO. So the bits, you know, when you when you see it in a correlated picture. So the lot of you know anti-forensic tools, majority of them actually garble and destroy the data. So they're not made so intelligent that they'll take the case away and point to another guy. So it's just like tap it to tell it. But most of these anti forensic tools will, will completely uh, gobble the data so that what you collect becomes very difficult to interpret. So data destruction, misdirection, hiding, contraception, all of these you can expect from these amazing software tools. And it becomes very hard for a forensic person to collect and then correlate the data once these tools are on. Now from an office perspective, as I shared, we have some formal structures of what we collect on metadata. And we also share that what we collect uh, from an office perspective, which means, and I'll give you a real case. If somebody, and this, is, this was a case where if somebody tampered with his salary details and other stuff uh, on a company letter, had printed and then you know submitted because he had to go somewhere or get an offer from an overseas company. So all of this got tracked in office. Well, he deleted everything, everything was finished and done. So we just used the office tool to track it. We were able to figure out what he did. 
So there are some tools built in office, again available, which you can practice on to collect the evidence. Same is with IE and so on. So I will skip this from it. And scope would also include the, the impact, uh, the sensitivity around it, if you do it. Uh, the effort which will get involved, whether it will be a week or 10 days, a longer period. Uh, technical things, would you be accessing network, would you be putting sniffers, uh, would you be as part of for instance going on to the storage, would you be retrieving the hard disk and then uh, doing a bitwise copy and then do offline or online, you know, check on that. Uh, what operating system would you touch it? So all of that you have already set in before you even started collection of the evidence. So for people who from the consulting background, in a way, it's, it's a kind of a SOW. But you're clearly putting it, because this could later be used uh, from your defense perspective as to what activities you carry on. Uh, Forensic is part of post response, so I'll, I'll place all these questions. So you spoke about damage, you spoke about containment of damage, and then you said the first step should be. So you're right in that way. So what happens is, if a security incident is discovered, and there is a term called cyber, cyber resilience. So are you cyber, is your organization cyber resilient? What that means is, if an attack happens, first are you able to defend it? you are not able to defend it, but the attack is currently going on, okay? And the nomenclature generally now we are moving from saying attack to a security incident because attack actually means a lot of things in the brainwave. So you will basically stick to a neutral word which is security incident. So if a security incident has happened and which you have to respond to, then as part of the response, there are two elements of response. One is uh, how do you handle it? and handle in terms of uh, media, uh, handle in terms of who do you call. So let's say, uh, which organization do you work in? Sir? Okay, part of it. So I'll not say that one. So assuming even in, in a large company, if, an, if a particular attack happens, uh, who would you go to? Let's take a quick poll. So let's say a bank, they had an attack. They get an email that you've been attacked and they've been asked ransom. What's their first reaction? Uh, and this, and if you are a part of a bank in the capacity of, let's say, a, a bank manager, and you, and you get to hear this or see this, who would you call? Okay, top management. CISO. CISO. Security team. Legal. Legal. Okay, who else? Third. Anybody from the back? Who do you call if you're a bank manager and you hear that it's been so-called attacked and data owners? Okay. Law enforcement agency. So imagine, guys, we all from security background. We have carriers on this. Right from. Somebody said legal, somebody said top management. Assuming it's top management and if it's a bank and I call Mr. XYZ and Mr. CEO of the bank has been attacked, what would be his reaction? Should he call CIO? Should he call CISO? If he call CISO, let's say the bank has, what would the CISO do? Should he, should he immediately issue a statement? Should he shut down the website? So that's answering to your question. Response while it's, while it's a very, very small word, has two parts. One is, what's the response management in case you are under attack? And the first thing in that is, you will have to call it a security incident and verify what's happening. The verification responsibility has to be an MDD, which includes network, storage, server, and so on the other team members, and has to be as part of a virtual team that sees so. You would not go to your legal, you will not go to your media, you will not go to your top and the first guy to be called has to be CISO, who should have this team pre-designated, who then has to first verify what it is. It might happen that somebody just made a wild, you know, 
match an intensive attempt and communicate that. It may not be that. It may be something else. You might see it's a DOS attack, but it was not a DOS attack. It was some internal input. It might be some other software vulnerability. You don't know. So first thing is that. Second would be your containment, where you say, okay, for me to be cyber resilient, if I am under attack, then can I respond in a way that my infrastructure continues either through my DR setup or do I have a, a cloud-based burst mechanism where my services will continue but I now may have to end up paying more for my web servers because they'll have to scale out because the attack is also growing and I'm also throwing physical infrastructure at it. And in the meantime, I will restore by blocking the IP addresses on the firewall. So that's, so then as I said, the two parts. So one is verification and how would you address it? And the second is the technical tools, processes, implementation, which you will do during that period so that you either minimize it or stop it. Okay? Forensic will start after that. Forensic would be when you want to know, based on the scope that you create, whether is it to find out who did it or is it to collect the evidence as to uh, what are the learning so that it doesn't occur again. So that's where you get into forensic. So it will be different and it will come post your response strategies. Yeah. Uh, uh, today to look at uh, the forensic is mostly like a where to the other area. And your question is having some validity because the SM tools are coupled with incident response and forensics. Where once the attack happens, they are able to snap, take the snapshot of the RAM and they are able to that's why what he's speaking about is the reactive forensics to be frank. Because I've been in this industry for more than 23 years, right? Uh, proactive forensics and today it has reached up to levels are called predictive. So forensics is not reactive. Forensics is from more from proactive, sorry, reactive to proactive to predictive. Right? So as you said, absolutely the SM tools couples with incident response and forensic simultaneously. That's what morning I mentioned something called SuperSOC. The security operation centers having all these capabilities together. The real-time monitoring of the traffic and real-time doing the forensic analysis. The tools have already existed in the market. But for in-depth analysis, as you said rightly, you have to go for this at the end of the day. There's no option at all. And I link to what he's saying. So this will be covered in the slides ahead. So what he's saying is, while you build your understanding on forensic, he's taking it to next level, where he's saying, why can't I do this collection on a regular basis? Essentially what he's saying is, if an incident happens, you do a respond and then you do forensic. And if you look back to slides, I also said that you will have to enable certain things. Otherwise, when you sit doing forensic, you would not, not have any data. So what he's saying is, why not make forensic in such a way that 24 hours for everything that you're doing, for suspicious behavior, all of this is getting collected. So that when the incident happens, you can go back. And that's what I refer to as a machine learning. So a machine a software is learning your behaviors, is learning what's happening around, is collecting what's happening around. If it sees a suspicious behavior, it's collecting the logs, it's collecting the dumps, it's collecting the copies of memory. Now, the question you would ask is, do I need it today? And which is a fair question because these are some newer technologies. And which sectors need it first and which sectors need it later? If I am into, let's say, uh, a call center which, which does financial processing, I may need it today because one of my call center agents may do something which would be unto. If I am in a different sector where my requirements are different, I may not need it to that much. Okay. So coming to the collection part, uh, so you will have to make an investigation kit, which would be hardware, software, apps, uh, toolkits, resource kits, cable, media, whatever you collect, which goes on that. And all of this toolkit would, would include uh, the likes of uh, manual, executed tools, automated tools, and machine learning tools. Then you'll have to look at some of the root case, because what happens is when you're, when you're going and collecting some data, regardless of the methodology, online, offline, 
there could be somebody who is already having a software, like a rootkit, which hides everything beneath and you, what you see is just a zero byte. Okay? So how do you look at those, those things? Like there is a, from a system terminal's perspective, there is a rootkit revealer. It's a command line tool which you can run. It has potential to reveal if there is any rootkit installed based on the pattern, the file size, the directory, where it takes. So that's there. And then the documentation which you have to build on to focus uh, or to be used in code evidence to be the next. Which will also be who performs what, what they're attempting to do, what is the timeline of these acts. So all of that would have to be built. And there are a couple of graphical tools also which come today, some free, some commercial, which, which build that timeline. Then the offline investigation. So what what are the two parts here? One is a bitwise copy and the other is volatile data. Now there is a rule in forensic if something is on, you let it be on and then take a snapshot. Because what activity has been done, there could be certain strains which are left in memory. There could be certain programs which steal some data but they have not been terminated because they came or they came into the memory as part of a buffer overflow. They were illegitimate software which came into the memory as part of buffer overflow. But if you shut the PC down, then they would also be automatically flushed out of the PC or server. So if you're collecting the evidence, so there are certain evidence which might go automatically out of the memory if you shut it down. So hence you, you would have tools which will help you to collect the memory dumps, which is the volatile data. So that you, if you suspect a particular server from where the information was leaked, then that's the case, then you know that the memory mm -hmm. is having that program which would have copied the data. Then it's better to have a copy of that memory also. Right? So there are tools to do that. And then you will also have, uh, you have many tools to do, to make a copy of the storage, which is the hard disks and other attached storage media so that you can then copy it onto your uh, toolkit, uh, your storage, or whatever drive you have to collect the evidence. Now, the benefit of this is when you do a bitwise copy, it also copies the free space, it also copies, which does not just copying only the filled space, it does the exact mirror copy, including the root files and the root spec, spec sector and all other details, so that you can then do a later offline investigation. And then you have logs, which will be your prime assets. You'll also have to tag what are your prime assets and secondary assets. So let's say if this server was compromised, but the source of that compromise or the access to that server was from a desktop or from another application, then you'll also have to look at the primary and the secondary assets from where you're collecting the evidence, followed by the environment in which you operate it. And then what you collect, again, what you collect for example, uh, a simple example could be when you copy some files and the files are precious, they're important. Let's take you copying some 10 photographs from a PC to your phone, what do you see? A simple check would be you will see whether the number 10 and 10 is matching, right? Other check you will see whether the size of the file is 10 MB here and if it's 10 MB here as well for all the 5, 6 files. So it's a basic checksum. Similarly, when you're doing a copy of large amount of data, you just want to be sure you're not missing something. Some attribute should not be set on a file which avoids it as part of your copy process. So there are some tools again available like FCI. So all these tools do an integrity check of whatever you copy so that what you have is a true copy because you have to leave that system running in some cases. In some cases, you may take it. Uh, and then if you, if you leave it there and you make a copy of that, then you could do an integrity check and then do an offline session. And then storing of data, how you're storing data, where it's getting stored again should be from a process standpoint clearly documented. And some of the tools we already listed in that uh, use case that we provided. Excuse me, could you just go back to the yeah. Next stage is 
So reach the point, you build the kits, you have a team, you have your toolkit, <coughs> you get a scope, you bank, you collected the data, you use various tools for offline, online, and you already have a hypothesis in your mind what you're trying to collect. And your hypothesis for different cases could be related to proving something or disproving something. Most of the cases would be in that fact. Next is you're analyzing the data. And this becomes the 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 stage where a maximum amount of effort goes. Okay. So you would have same tools, ARTA, packet inspection. So when you're analyzing data, so you could either have existing tools which are installed on your setup, for example, existing SIM tools, which already are collecting a month's more of data, and you can go back in time in that and do some kind of an analysis based on that. There's also tools like ARTA, which is called as advanced threat analytics. Uh, so both SIM tools and advanced threat analytics tools are available from Microsoft as well, plus from other vendors. So in case of advanced threat analytics, what's happening is, what this gentleman also spoke about, is a predictive way. Okay? So what advanced analytics does, it uses a machine learning language. So for example, if you carry a phone, your phone knows more about you. What you read, uh, what you see, what pictures you click, where you go, uh, what you type, how fast you type, whether you're running, jogging, what time you sleep, Dominantly, if, if you have access to anybody's phone and the metadata, you can predict the behavior of the person. I can tell you if I know this data for the last two years, next Sunday what you would be doing if it's a month of January or if it's a month. If I have that data longer, I can predict that information. Okay? So what advanced rate analytics does in a way is, it is learning behavior of all the devices, PCs, servers, Communication that server to server is happening, application to application is happening. So it's learning all of this in log and it requires massive storage in that depending on how you configure it. And then based on that, the idea is to not predict it in, in forensic perspective. The idea is to go back in time because the incident has happened and you have to go back in time and see and relate. Okay. And then it also comes with deep packet inspection or technology so that it can store that data for you to retrieve it later. Now, analysis of host data like caches, log, prefetch folder, by the way, Windows prefetch folder reveals way more than any other folder. So it exactly tells you what you do. And there are some forensic capabilities that we already built in uh, Office, we built in browser. So there are tools which if you use, for example, if you're employing the organization, used a browser and did something, which including and accessing a site which he was not supposed to, which could have a confidential HR data. If you have to prove that he actually went and did it, what would he do? He would do a in private browsing so that nobody is able to see it from the cache, right? But there are tools which are available from Microsoft so that you can go and check the browsing status, which means a normal user may not be able to go and check those logs, but you would have those forensic tools for you to go and check those logs and see at what time he did what and went on what sites, whether internal or external, and did he actually downloaded some of the confidential HR data. Okay. So, so those would be the tools which will be part of your analysis process. And uh, when you will examine, uh, you can also look at some of the tools like Process, Explorer, Logon Session, ES file. Uh, if it's a server which you believe is compromised, then most of these servers uh, automatically attach themselves or the malware attaches to some of the auto-run processes. So there are also tools so that you can check uh, what processes are automatically getting run on a particular machine. And if, if in a case where encrypted file system is there, so that's a major hurdle for forensic experts because sometimes they have the data they have taken a bitwise copy, but that folder or that particular data is encrypted. Now what do you do with the encrypted drives? You'll have to again check what tools and processes you can follow. So we are not giving you guidance that any encryption can be broken, so it's a lengthy process. Even if you have to break into an encrypted file system, it requires understanding, plus it requires a lot of compute power, even if you have to do some kind of a brute force. And if it's implemented with different kinds of algorithms, let's say AES1024, in some cases you can't 
So just check as to what encryption uh, if is there and if is there what's what's followed. In some cases, the encryption is from an enterprise, and if the encryption is from the enterprise like EFS, you do have formal ways of getting a recovery key. So in that case, if you get a recovery key, you can decrypt that data from the forensic inspector, but you'll have to check that. Um, the online forensic, there are some tools which Microsoft also has from an online forensic, which will be able to uh, pick up things in registry, peripheral memory, caches, main memory, network state. So all that from a running perspective also gets captured uh, so that you can do a later analysis. And, and uh, all the tools which I'm showing you, are free, so Microsoft doesn't charge us other than the advanced threat analytics, which is more from a predictive perspective. So the idea was to tell you about the tools, not to sell you because we don't sell them. They're all complementary. Now the memory analysis also, the, from a tools perspective, is there, uh, which can even uh, pick up things from the raw dump or crash dump or a virtual machine state. So again, there are certain tools which have been listed out that can be. So this is the kind of structure which you get. This is a commercial tool value. Now, once you're doing forensic, you'll also hit this new creator, which is malware. Because when you're doing forensic, uh, post an incident, uh, it could be that the incident did occur, but the agent to carry that incident, or the agent that enabled that incident, was some kind of a malware that was still sitting in your, in your PC or in your server. So it's a malicious software. Uh, it could be a Trojan horse. It's basically designed uh, to let some unfederated access to do an activity which otherwise is deemed as illegal from you working. <coughs> so this is what you'll be doing, practically checking the pieces there and the servers if they're in a good state or not. Okay. And if you look from a malware perspective, uh, today we are somewhere on the top end where Earlier people used to have uh, scripts and tools, used to do it for fun. Uh, totally cyber crime, to the group who is there, you're well aware it's fairly organized. And just to give you a typical hacker in Russia, probably makes more than 150,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, so that's a good amount of money. Until too many of them get created to lower the price, but the current state is that they make too much of money. And there's a good amount of money involved, serious money, uh, in, in, in hacking and spinach activities. So today you see more of uh, organized hacker groups. So the solo guys will put a script and run. So they're still there, but uh, the number is, 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 is very low. So currently the trends that you see are more related to you know uh, operations which are done together by organized folks. And then the most states concert the uh, you know things that are happening. Now this is a glimpse of 2014. Uh, but I'm also pleased to share with you, within Delhi, uh, Microsoft has opened Cyber Security Engagement Center. Now that's an engagement center where we call all the customers of Microsoft uh, and show them a live feed of malware which is coming out of India. Now it's a secure facility. It's a service that Microsoft delivers to the customers at no cost. It's also a service where uh, we had yes from the LCA team. So it's a service which is run by our, uh, our legal team. So it's a service where our legal team uh, does certain operations uh, on botnet. So they go and actually track down malware and they do a, a botnet operation. So in India, they work closely with Cert uh, India. They also work closely with the law enforcement agencies in India. Uh, for example, Ramnet, which was a botnet, was taken down a few months back working very closely with the Indian law enforcement agencies. So Ramblin was a botnet, a malware, which was stealing information. It's a financial category botnet. And if you search for it, so the amount of money which has got measured into Ramblin is close to half a million dollars in different bank accounts. So today in India, uh, we stand number one when it comes to malware print. Now there could be various reasons. So we are far ahead, the US is number four. So we show this trending data and we also show a live feed. So the feed that we show to the customers when they visit our cybersecurity engagement center in Delhi is 
we show them across different gateways, whether it would be Telco 1 gateway or Telco 2 gateway. We show them in live the amount of threads which are coming. And those threads which are viewed, so I'll give you an average, should of, of the recent uh, visits that we have done. So roughly in a day, around 12 million malware threads are eliminated from India on a daily basis. Okay. So this is a little outdated slide. Uh, but just to share with you, so if any of you or, or your organization would be interested, so as again said, it's a, it's a complimentary offering, no cost, no commitment offering, where the intent is uh, for Microsoft to educate and make aware the customers on these threats and also then share some of the tools uh, through which a remediation process can happen. So that's uh, uh, one-time complimentary anti-manager assessment. So this is also what we do for customers, where if they give us their public IP addresses, then we can uh, use some of the big data uh, platforms that we have uh, to map on some of these threads which they're coming from and share with them a report which tells them if their uh, infrastructure, servers and PCs potentially could be infected with malware. Now some of the client forensic tools that we have, so this again is a list which is uh, available in the sheet. So this quickly tells if you have to do a disk copy, what are the tools which would be available? And by the way, if you do a disk copy and it had a malware, that would come in the disk copy as well. So that's why it's also important to look at uh, an anti malware or also keep that in mind when you're doing forensic activities. And there's other things as well which are listed out on the side if you have to make a disk copy. Now, there's some of the locations where some of the client forensic tools entries would be made. So again, this is for more of a detailed uh, discussion where you could have these slides. And as I said, there is there are tools available for ID and there are tools available for Office other than Windows and the tools which are shown, which can generate a lot of data which could be of uh, interest to a forensic investigator. Now, as you analyze the data, uh, you would have to look at the network, the, the disk copy data that you have. Uh, you have to study the metadata of the files. There are some commercially available tools like NK, NTK, uh, Pro Discovery. So these are commercially available tools, fairly priced, but they value for the money because the amount of graphical intelligence and intuitiveness it brings into the forensic is, is very, very high and amazing. So these are some of the tools as well which are non-microsoft but commercially available. Some versions I guess are some freely available versions would also be there which could be used for analyzing the data. And then you also have another very handy utility file viewer which gives you a quick view on the usage of files and peaks and patterns so that you can put a timeline that it can match with respect to if the incident happened during a Friday night and a Saturday morning then what are the files which are maximum getting access to that time. And then comes the final stage where you're building a report. So you've gone through the earlier stage from assessing the situation to acquiring the data. You've gone through made it of tools in that you've scoped it well. Uh, you have put the data analysis and analysis while it was a longer part. Uh, today it's, it's aided with some of the advanced threat analytics and some of the uh, sim based tools which can even do a, a back end calendar time and then relaying the data. Next comes is report generation. So now, now is the time when you'll, when you'll have to see whether the data is supporting the hypothesis that you went through. If data supports the hypothesis, then you have the evidence and then you can either produce for the next step, which would be an internal combination or uh, a kind of a reminder to an employee, or if it's to be produced in the code of law, then it would be depending on the, the legal next step that you take. So in which you will clearly a purpose of report authors, the incident summary timeline. So most of these forensic reports come at time when I shared with you there's some graphical tools available for that as well. And your hypothesis which you will clearly chart it out. This is what you were looking at when you collected or started collecting the, the evidence. The evidence details and all those things that you had in assess the situations are there mentioned which will use the detailed scope. Uh, the collection process and the conclusion which generally becomes hard because then what we have seen during forensic evidence is there is there is still a good amount of time 
where you neither can prove something or disprove something, but you don't have sufficient data. So what do you do? So as a forensic person, you had a hypothesis. Should you say, while I have insufficient data, I believe based on my gut or judgment, this was committed. Uh, while if it's committed, how do you prove it's committed by this individual? So there will be times when there will be gray areas. So I don't have any answer to that. And should you go in a very pro or in a you know different fashion? But that will that will depend. You know, if it's a what what we have seen is when it's more about national security or certain incident where the government is involved, then they take they tend to take a hard stand. Okay. And a conclusion and supporting document. So so with this, what will happen is your your process of forensic would finish, and you will at least be able to. Submit a report, whether to the internal stakeholders or to the uh, law enforcement agency, or uh, to the issuing, you know, order issuing body. Now, next is it will be incomplete if you don't talk about anti-forensic. Okay, so there are tools available in the market. I would say a lot of them really available, bulk of them, uh, which if ran, because as forensic, what you're doing is you're collecting evidence. But what if somebody is smart enough to run an anti-forensic tool and he's either fractured that evidence so that whatever interpretation you will do is wrong. And that's been done deliberately. For example, you are looking at catching this employee which you suspect has uh, copied the confidential HR data and revealed on the internet. But what if this employee was smart cookie where he already ran anti-forensic tool where half of the data has been deleted and some junk data has been keyed in so that when you start collecting evidence with this hypothesis, he suddenly pointed that this was not done or the data would say this is done by CEO. So imagine if you start collecting and it points to it's been done by CEO. So the bits, you know, when you, when you see it in a correlated picture. So there are a lot of, you know, anti-forensic tools, majority of them actually garble and destroy the data. So they're not made so intelligent that they'll take the case away and point to another guy. So it's just like tap it to tell it. But most of the anti-forensic tools will will completely uh, gobble the data so that what you collect becomes very difficult to interpret. Okay. So data destruction, misdirection, hiding, contraception, all of these you can expect from these amazing software tools. And it becomes very hard for a forensic uh, person to collect and then correlate the data once these things are okay. Now from an office perspective, as I shared, we have some formal structures of what we collect on metadata. And we also share that what we collect uh, from an office perspective, which means, and I'll give you a real case. If somebody, and this, is, this was a case where if somebody tampered with his salary details and other stuff, uh, on the company letter had printed and then you know submitted because he had to go somewhere or get an offer from an overseas company. Okay. So all of this got tracked in office. Well, he deleted everything, everything was finished and done. So we just used the office tool to track it. We were able to figure out what he did. So there are some tools built in office, again available, which you can track this on to collect the evidence. Same is with IE and so on. So I'll skip this from 